Welcome to Fortune Forecast. I am Daisy, and you're joining me as I'm reading through Genevieve Baran's book titled Your Invisible Power, published in 1921, and it is in the public domain. We just went through a beautiful chapter where Genevieve talked about her passion for this quest. Even in her testimonial, there is a sense that her desire for a better quality of life was putting things in motion for her. The things that she was doing and the people she was talking to, it was kind of leading one thing to the next until she came across Troward's material. And how at that moment she started feeling elevated, yet there was a situation she was dealing with, which was the need for increasing her finances. So it's interesting to see what we're going to discover in chapter nine. So that's where I'm going to jump in. Titled, How I Attracted to Myself $20,000. In the laboratory of experience in which my newly revealed relation to divine operation was to be tested, the first problem was a financial one. My income was a stipulated one, quite enough for my everyday needs, but it did not seem sufficient to enable me to go comfortably to England where Troward lived and remain for an indefinite period to study with so great a teacher as he must be. So before inquiring whether Troward took pupils or whether I would be eligible in case he did, I began to use the paragraph I had memorized. Daily, in fact, almost hourly, the words were in my mind. Quote, unquote. My mind is a center of divine operation, and divine operation means expansion into something better than has gone before. From the Edinburgh lectures, I had read something about the law of attraction, and from the chapter of Causes and Conditions, I had gleaned a vague idea of visualizing. So every night, before going to sleep, I made a mental picture of the desired $20,000. $20,000 bills were counted over each night in my bedroom, and then, with the idea of more emphatically impressing my mind with the fact that this $20,000 was for the purpose of going to England, and studying with Troward. I wrote out my picture, saw myself buying my steamer ticket, walking up and down the ship's deck from New York to London, and finally saw myself accepted as Troward's pupil. This process was repeated every morning and every evening, always impressing more and more fully upon my mind Troward's memorized statement, quote, my mind is a center of divine operations, end quote. I endeavored to keep this statement in the back part of my consciousness all the time with no thought in mind as how the money might be obtained. Probably the reason why there was no thought of the avenues through which the money might reach me was because I could not possibly imagine where the $20,000 would come from. So I simply held my thoughts steady and let the power of attraction find its own ways and means. One day, while walking on the street, taking deep breathing exercises, the thought came, quote, My mind is surely a center of divine operation. If God fills all space, then God must be in my mind also. If I want this money to study with Troward that I may know the truth of life, then both the money and the truth must be mine, though I am unable to feel or see the physical manifestations of either still. Quote, end quote, I declare, quote, it must be mine, end quote. While these reflections were going on in my mind, there seemed to come up from within me the thought, I am all the substance there is. Then from another channel in my brain, the answer seemed to come, of course that's it. Everything must have its beginning in mind. The I, the idea, must be the only one and primary substance there is. 
And this means money as well as everything else. My mind accepted this idea and immediately all the tension of my mind and body was relaxed. There was a feeling of absolute certainty of being in touch with all the power life has to give. All thought of money, teacher, or even my own personality vanished in the great wave of joy which swept over my entire being. I walked on and on with this feeling of joy steadily increasing and expanding until everything about me seemed aglow with resplendent light. Every person I passed was illuminated as I was. All consciousness of personality had disappeared and in its place there came that great and almost overwhelming sense of joy and contentment. That night, When I made my picture of the $20,000, it was with an entirely changed aspect. On previous occasions, when making my mental picture, I had felt that I was waking up something within myself. This time, there was no sensation of effort. I simply counted over the $20,000. Then, in a most unexpected manner, from a source of which I had no consciousness at the time, there seemed to open a possible avenue through which the money might reach me. At first it took great effort not to be excited. It all seemed so wonderful, so glorious to be in touch with supply. But had not Troward cautioned his readers to keep all excitement out of their minds in the first flush of realization of union with the infinite supply, and to treat this fact as a perfectly natural result that had been reached through our demand? This was even more difficult for me than it was to hold the thought that all the substance there is, I am, I, idea, am the beginning of all form, visible or invisible. Just as soon as there appeared a circumstance which indicated the direction through which the $20,000 might come, I not only made a supreme effort to regard the indicated direction calmly, as the first sprout of the seed I had sown in the absolute, but left no stone unturned to follow up that direction by fulfilling my part. By so doing, one circumstance seemed naturally to lead to another, until, step by step, my desired $20,000 was secured. To keep my mind poised and free from excitement was my greatest effort. This first concrete fruition of my study of mental science, as expounded by Troward's book, had come by a careful following of the methods he had outlined. In this connection, therefore, I can offer to the reader no better gift than to quote Troward's book, The Edinburgh Lectures, from which may be derived a complete idea of the line of action I was endeavoring to follow. In the chapter on causes and conditions, he says, to get good results, we must properly understand our relation to the great impersonal power we are using. It is intelligent and we are intelligent and the two intelligence must cooperate. We must not fly in the face of the law expecting it to do for us what it can only do through us. And we must therefore use our intelligence with the knowledge that it is acting as the instrument of a greater intelligence. And because we have this knowledge, we may and should cease from all anxiety as to the final result. In actual practice, we must first form the ideal conception of our object with the definite intention of impressing it upon the universal mind. It is this thought that takes such thought out of the region of mere casual fancies and then affirm that our knowledge of the law is sufficient reason for a calm expectation of a corresponding result. And 
that therefore all necessary conditions will come to us in due order. We can then turn to the affairs of our daily life with the calm assurance that the initial conditions are either there already or will soon come into view. If we do not at once see them, let us rest content with the knowledge that the spiritual prototype is already in existence and wait till some circumstance pointing in the desired direction begins to show itself. It may be a very small circumstance, but it is the direction and not the magnitude that is to be taken into consideration. As soon as we see it, we should regard it as the first sprouting of the seed sown in the absolute and do calmly and without excitement whatever the circumstances seem to require and then later on we shall see that this doing will in turn lead to a further circumstance in the same direction until we find ourselves conducted step by step to the accomplishment of our object. In this way, the understanding of the great principle of the law of supply will, by repeated experiences, deliver us more and more completely out of the region of anxious thought and toilsome labor and bring us into a new world where the useful employment of all our powers, whether mental or physical, will only be an unfolding of our individuality upon the lines of its own nature and therefore a perpetual source of health and happiness, a sufficient inducement surely to the careful study of the laws governing the relation between the individual and the universal mind. To my mind, then as now, this quotation outlines the core and center of the method and manner of approach necessary for coming in touch with infinite supply. At least, it, together with the previously quoted statement, my mind is a center of divine operation, etc., constituted the only apparent means of attracting to myself the twenty thousand dollars. My constant endeavor to get into the spirit of these statements and to attract to myself this needed sum was about six weeks, at the end of which time I had in my bank the required twenty thousand dollars. This could be made into a long story, giving all the details, but the facts, as already narrated, will give you a definite idea of the magnetic condition of my mind while the $20,000 was finding its way to me. And that concludes chapter nine. Wow. I'm excited. How about you? Come on, let's head over to chapter 10.